Good morning. Randy, you were one of the troublemakers also. <laughs> but anyway, that's just beautiful to see everybody sharing time and just having fellowship. And, uh, but I guess we're going to have a service also today. <laughs> so I just want to give, give you a few announcements. Uh, we've been talking about the Sanctity of Life and the baby bottles in the back, back here. Well, next Sunday is the last Sunday, so if you have a, a baby bottle, make sure you bring it in full, of course, of change or money or whatever. Or if you haven't done that yet, grab one on your way out, one of the empty ones. Um, <laughs> we're not going to put milk or anything in them. Or, uh, a home group, uh, the home group. Uh, is having another movie night on uh, next next Sunday at six o'clock, uh, and we're going to show a little trailer of that in just a few minutes. It's the name of the movie is Show Me the Father. So come at six o'clock, and we'll have a meal and some popcorn, and just have some fellowship as we watch this movie. Um, also, just reminding, like we've talked, a reminder about the lost and found that we have on the right side behind the counter. I think uh, there's some, a lot of stuff back there, so just check and see if he may have something. Of course, if you're a visitor, you probably don't have anything, so you don't need to check. Um, uh, and then uh, another thing is that uh, one of the things that the transition team is doing is having uh, trying to develop a history of our church over the last 40 years. So if you all have some pictures or documents that you would like to share, uh, you know, make a copy of them and maybe give them to one of the transition team members or bring them to Mike, but make sure you identify those so that you can get those back. Uh, and then finally, um, just want to remind you that uh, uh, Brother Mike is here on Wednesdays most of the time. 
And so if you'd like to come by and see him and visit with him about some issue or anything about our church or, or uh, uh, just uh, uh, call the office and make an appointment. So anyway, that's about all I've got. Randy, are you ready? To... Are we going to do the movie? What are we doing? Okay. All right. Haven't I been a good father? I need somebody to show me. You're pushing all the buttons that didn't want to hear the dad say. All of us have a fatherhood story. My dad was my hero growing up. My father was somebody who disappointed you. To have my father proud was my sole purpose of playing football. I want to make a difference in the lives of young people the way my father made a difference in my life. We put a representation of our father and all of our families. I prayed for me and my brother and my mom to get through this night. I think we live in seven different houses, kind of running from my dad. I started losing my ability to walk. We didn't realize the war that was going on inside of him. Wishing that I could just die. Lord, why didn't you give me a dad I could call? Because I need wisdom right now. I knew that I wasn't prepared to be anybody's mom. I was doing the right thing for him. I panicked. And Sherman says, man, listen, calm down. It is a beautiful thing to have a child. This is why I do what I do. Guys like that. I mean, it was like the hair on the back of my neck is standing up. She said, I can tell that you already love her. I would get asked about family history. I didn't have any answers because I didn't know. Did you have a baby in 1972 in Allegheny County? She says back, yes. Oh, man, this is her. I'm stunned. He's real. He's really out there. And this is really him. This is really him. In the Bible, the blessing is everything. I declare that you are a beloved son in whom we are well pleased. You're Pushing all the buttons that men want to hear their dad say. It was the first time I had been called out like that. He was that first man that paid attention to me. He was treating me like a dad would. No perfect father in heaven can change the trajectory of your life. It's like the light came through, and I wept till I couldn't weep anymore. You are unconditionally loved. Haven't I been a good father? I need somebody to show me. That's powerful. <laughs> just, just the trailer is. <laughs> <clears throat> We have a special guest with us today, and uh, it's Linda Pollard. She's going to come sing for us. Good morning, church family. How are you? I don't know a lot of you or some of you, but... No matter where we go, if we're in the body of Christ, we're with family. Amen. I uh, hear there's some exciting things happening out here at Chapel Hill Baptist Church, and there's such a dynamic, sweet spirit out here. We, we feel um, at home, and thank you for welcoming us. My husband, Mark, is with me today. I haven't convinced him to get up here and sing with me, so I guess I'm going solo today. So without uh, any more, we'll go ahead. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. 
How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. Please sing the words that are right behind me. The Lord has promised good to me, His word my hope secure will my shield and Thank you, Linda, and thank y'all for just joining in there and singing. I can hear you. <laughs> Sometimes I don't get to hear you when I'm up here directing, but I can see your lips moving. <laughs> it's that amazing grace and the love of our God that lifts us out of the depths. Let's stand and sing, Love Lifted Me. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, from the waters lifted me, now safe am I. To him I cling, ever to him I cling. 
in his blessed presence live, ever his praises sing. Love so mighty and so true, there is my soul's best song. Faithful, loving service to, to him belong. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Souls in danger, look above, Jesus completely saves. He will lift you by his love out of the angry ways. He's the master of the sea, fills his will obey. He, your Savior, wants to be, be saved today. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. There's the wonder of sunset. At evening, the wonder at sunrise I see, but the wonder of wonders that thrills my soul is the wonder that God loves me. Oh, the wonder of it all. The wonder of it all, just to think that God loves me. Oh, the wonder of it all, the wonder of it all, just to think that God loves me. Just to think that God loves me. Amen. Well, can be seated. Robert, come and read our scripture this morning. We are reading from Isaiah 40, 27 through 31. Why do you complain, Jacob? Why do you say, Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord. My cause will be discarded by God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary. In his understanding, no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increase the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and the young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on the wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be, and not be, faith, be faint. Excuse me. Let's pray. Dear most Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for the, that it teaches us. Now, Father, we pray that you would bless our services today. Pray that you bless Mike as he delivers your message. Father, you have a word for each and every one of us, Lord, and help us to be pay attention and hear what that might be and guide us and direct us as we go about our lives serving you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Robert. Let's stand together again as we sing, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, 
Songs are songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious song that sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I come, and I hope. Safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor. Daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy grace, Lord, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. like you, Lord. There is none like you. No one else can touch my heart like you do. I could search for all eternity long and find there is none like you. There is none like you. No one else can touch my heart like you do. I could search for all eternity long. There is none like you. Your mercy flows like a river. Healing comes from your hand. Suffering children are safe in your arms. There is none like you. There is none like you. No one else can touch my heart like you. search for all eternity long and find there is none there is none there is none like you Amen. Heavenly Father we just there is none like you no one else can touch our hearts like you do. Lord, we just, we turn our lives over to you today again. Lord, we just ask that the words preached today, Lord, and the words that are sung in our hearts, Lord, will touch us. Lord, and help us to be a better Christian, to reach those around us who don't even know you. And we give you all the praise and the glory in Christ's name. Amen. So I do kind of have some family in this congregation. Connie and Joe Vara are dear friends of ours. And Connie and I have known each other for years. And um, we're soul sisters. Um, 
confidants and besties and all of that good stuff. And I got a text from her several months back, and it said, I need to see you now. When you get those 911 distress texts or calls, you know that you better you better get with it. So we we agreed to meet, and um, she sat across from me, and she just began to weep as she shared with me what your church has has been going through. And she was very discreet and didn't name names and didn't point fingers. Um, but simply shared some of the events that had taken place. <clears throat> and um, as I listened to her and saw the, the heartbreak that she was dealing with, I began to weep for you because I've been in the middle of what you have been going through, and it is brutal. And as I listened to her share, the Lord spoke in my spirit, and said it was a necessary break. And I didn't give that thought a whole lot of uh, weight at that time, but after we left the restaurant that night, several hours later, um, I got in the car and I'm like, okay, Lord, what, what do you mean a necessary break? How can, this, how can this be a good thing? And he began to just, in my mind, uh, bring little bits and pieces of things I've heard over the years about broken bones and that sometimes when bones are malformed or deformed, they have to be broken. They have to be broken in order to heal and they have to be broken in order to align with other bones. And so I started reading about that. Okay, what happens, you know, when a bone has to be rebroken and why do you have to why do bones have to be broken? And there were several things that uh that it said, and it said one of the things that can happen if you don't take care of the problem is it will affect the way you move. You may not be able to move as freely if your bones are not aligned correctly. How many of y'all want to be able to move freely in the spirit here? You want to be able to move and fulfill and, and, and fulfill the purposes that God has called your congregation to. God is aligning you with his word, with his purpose for this congregation. And that couldn't happen unless there was a break. The Lord just began to show me that there were some mindsets and some strongholds here that were going to prevent you from moving freely in the spirit and prevent you from aligning with the purpose that God has called you to. So we're going to let we're going to let the other stuff go. We're going to let the other people go and let them hopefully go in align with what God's calling them to do. What they do is no longer a concern. What we do is we want to align with the word of God and with his purposes so that we are free to move in the spirit and accomplish all that he has for us. And the second thing it said, you know, sometimes bones are broken. A, a bone deformity is not visually pleasing. It doesn't look good. And I begin to think of what is the Lord when he's looking down on our church bodies, not just here, but all, everywhere, all across the world. What does he see when he looks at our church bodies? Are we, are we visually pleasing to him? And I don't mean in what we wear and, and how we... But spiritually, are we pleasing to him when he sees us? And are we pleasing to those outside of our walls that may be looking at us going, well, do I want to try that church out? Do I want to maybe step inside those doors? So for those that are looking for a safe haven, do we look pleasing to what they see, does it make them want to come be a part of us? And what I see here is the answer to that is yes. From the minute we stepped in the door, we were welcomed into peace and just such a, a sweet spirit. So I'm so excited. I'm so excited that now, because of that necessary break, God is healing and he's mending and he's aligning you 
so that you can fulfill that purpose. And so Connie and I met again last week. We, uh, we do that fairly often. We decided it's good for our mental health and it's a whole lot cheaper than therapy. So uh, we try to be consistent with that. And as we talked, she began to share uh, just what God has been doing out here. And, uh, and this, this time she did name some names. And um, she said, the Lord has sent the most wonderful couple to us, this man named Mike Habermel. And I'm like, you know, my heart just did a cartwheel when I heard that. I have known Mike and Judy for most of my life probably more years than any, any of us wants to really admit. But Mike and my mother taught together years ago when I was a little girl. So I've grown up seeing the fruit of, of this couple and their, their commitment and dedication to the Lord. And I'm, I'm so blessed to know that they are the ones leading you through this transition. And as Connie was telling me this, I once again heard the Lord speak, and he said, I'm repairing their foundation. And a lot of, some of you may have had to have foundation work on your house before. And you know what happens if you don't do that foundational work. The whole house is going to crumble. But the Lord said, I'm, I'm repairing their foundation. And sometimes that's, a pro, that's always a process. But what a joy to have this couple walking you through that and, and um, that you have bonded together and you have set your, your heart to follow the Lord, walk in his way, let whatever in the past, let it go. Because as I was praying for you last night, I had a, <clears throat> a vision of your church. It was dark in my vision. And I looked up and I saw your church and there was a just a halo of light covering it. And the Lord says he's going to make you a beacon of hope and light for this community. So you stand firm and you keep going and you keep doing that foundational work and you keep pressing in and aligning yourself with the word of God and all that he has for you. I believe that in the not too distant future, when we come back, we're going to see the, this, this place filled because God is going to send those that maybe couldn't have received in another season, but now they can, and he brought the uh, scripture that we've all heard, there was a song, I don't know, back in the 60s or 70s, that for every, everything, there's a purpose and a season and a time, and if you read through some of those, I used to read that, and it would say, there's a time for mourning, and a time for laughing, a time for dying, a time, for living and a time for tearing down and a time for building up. There is a reason, a purpose for every single thing that we go through. And I used to go, oh, I'm not trying to do some of those bad seasons. I just want to do the good seasons. But the Lord's very clear that every single season that we go through is so important. If you look outside right now, we're on a, today's a pretty day, but on days when it's dreary and you know, the, the fields are all dead, the trees don't have any leaves on them, and it looks pretty, you know, pretty sad outside some days. But what we don't see is what's going on underneath the ground. In those winter months when everything seems dead and like there's no life happening, there's a whole lot happening under the surface so that when spring comes, everything can bloom and blossom and come to life. So don't regret the season that you're in because this is a time that God is doing a whole lot of work under the surface. And before long, you're going to see the fruit of that. And I had a different song picked out today, but Mark and I both did the COVID thing about a month ago. And I am still uh, don't quite have full use of my voice. So when it was all said and done, I feel like this song may be one that the Lord would like you to hear. Hope that you can sit back and just let him love on you. Let him encourage your spirits today as you go forward. Um, I'm so excited to see what the Lord is going to do uh, in your church body. So. When I am down and oh, my soul so weary when troubles come and my heart 
heart burn in fear when I am still wait here in the silence until you come and stay a while with me you raise me up so I can stand on mountains you raise me up to walk on stormy sea. I am strong when I am on your shoulder. You raise me up to more than I can be. There is no lie. No life without a good. Each restless heart beats so imperfectly. But when you come, I am filled with wonder. Sometimes I think I glimpse eternity. You raise me up so I can stand on mountains. You raise me up, walk on stormy seas. I am strong when I am on your shoulders. You raise me up. God love you, Glenda Perry. I can't remember the last time I've seen that youngin. And uh, I thought the world and all of her mom and dad. Bob was uh, with Lynn for many years and, and Sue with uh, Brenham ISD. If, you, uh, if you've got a copy of the scripture, you might like to turn over to Galatians. Uh, we're going to read that in a while, but as I sometimes do, I'm going to spend a little time looking at some other verses. And you can turn to them if you would like. And uh, Matthew, there, there you go. I, if I seem a little confused sometimes, my glasses don't work like up here. And sometimes I, I have a hard time seeing that screen. So uh, if I get lost, somebody come and rescue me. There's some scriptures that have always kind of interested me as I've read them. And sometimes kind of have given me a chuckle as I did. And 
and wonder what was behind that. What was Paul thinking? Or what was he seeing when, when he saw this? And, and this is one in, in Romans 12, 18. Uh, and this is out of the NIV, which you may have in front of you. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Now, why, why would Paul write that? Would he write it to perfect people, to church people? Would he write it to people that didn't always get along with one another? Did Paul have some old sore heads in his church? Whew. Did he have some folks who were difficult? Some people that had issues? Alan, did you invite people to come and talk to me if they had issues a while ago? Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. Do we have folks? Yeah, maybe Paul had people like that too. A little different take on that sir, that same out of the New Living Translation. Do all that you can do to live in peace with everyone. And then finally, oh, Eugene Peterson's take uh, out of the message. If you got it in you, and I kind of like that, if you got it in you, get along with everybody. You know, how... How many, how many times have, have you heard preachers stand up and preach that to you? Not very often because sometimes it's kind of couched in spiritual language and sometimes people don't really get the point. But this kind of gets the point across to you. Can you imagine Paul standing up in front and just, let's just get along? Or I watched a, a video that someone from a former church shared with me, this young man. It was all funny, but... He was up, and his sermon was basically, don't do that. Okay? There are times maybe when we need to say that. Some other passages, in, and, and look at this one um, in, uh, in 2 Timothy. The young man Timothy had probably run into some of those folks in his church. He may have been one of them. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Go ahead. There you go. Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments. I'm sure Paul emphasized that. Because you know they produce quarrels, and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome. I wonder if this often gets preached at seminary. Must not be quarrelsome and be kind to everyone, able to teach and not resentful. Next, next one, Matthew. The church at Thessalonica. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. I've sometimes had people come and say, uh, especially young folks, I just, Mike, I just, I can't, I don't know what God's will is for me. And sometimes you turn to this passage, that's not what they want to know. They want to know who they're supposed to marry. They want to know where they're supposed to go to school. They want to know what they're going to do in life. But this is pretty clear language. This is something that God wants for all of us, not just for some of us. Rejoice. Oh, that's okay. I won't read it again. If we have any hope of a spontaneous, authentic spiritual experience at some point in our lives, this isn't scripture, by the way. This is a, a quote that just absolutely knocked me out of my chair when I, when I read it the first time. It will only be born of the continual practice of choosing what is loving and right, cultivating the habits of virtue so that they may become natural or second nature. Then as Plato says, and I can't remember the last time I quoted Plato in my sermon, maybe never, the mask, if worn long enough, may become the face or or as my grandma used to say, if you keep making that face, it might get stuck that way. Or as my mom used to say, it may freeze that way. And I heard that a lot when I had my lip pooched out, you know, because something had not gone very well. 
Now, why in the world would I bring up something like this? Well, the fact is, so many church issues begin with the way we treat one another and the attitude that we have with one another. There are some church disputes that revolve around theology, but sooner or later, they usually degrade into disputes about personalities and about viewpoints and about not what's right in the Scripture, but who's right, who's quoting the Scripture. And so Paul spends time in virtually every letter that he wrote to the churches, at least to the ones that we have in our copy of the Scripture, he spent some time giving some good earthly wisdom and telling folks, if you keep behaving that way, you may freeze that way. You may get stuck that way. And God love us all. But a lot of churches I walk into have those problems. And First Baptist Chapel Hill is no exception. Can somebody say amen to that? Okay. <laughs> Galatians chapter 5. Galatians is probably the first letter that we have from Paul. We don't know that, but it seems to be fairly early in, in his missionary career. And for the first four chapters, he talks theology. He talks about how, how Jesus has fulfilled the covenant of Abraham and how it is that what Jesus did on the cross provides a way of salvation for the people who are hearing the message, the people in the world, that God so loved the world that he sent his only son. And Paul works that out in wonderful relationship to the Old Testament story of Abraham. And the reason is there are a lot of Jewish folk involved in this church that he is writing to, and they are causing immense problems by insisting that the, the Gentiles in that church become Jews before they can become proper Christians. I don't run into too many churches that have that issue anymore. However, what was playing out in this was that there had developed this tremendous dispute. And so Paul lays some theological groundwork so that everybody's kind of on the same page. And they, they were in some respects, okay? Even the, even the Jewish Christians believed what Paul was teaching. It's just that they didn't want to turn loose of the law that they had held so faithfully to for all those years. And so in verse 13, he begins to turn away from the theology to everyday living for these folks. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. And, and chapter 5 starts out with these words, it is for freedom that Christ has set you free. I, I don't know, I, I haven't counted how many times that word freedom comes up in here, but Paul doesn't get very far away from it. Because what he's seeing is that the church is slowly sinking back into the lack of freedom that it once had. If you walk into a church and they have a list of regulations for you, you're not going to feel very free. If they have a lot of demands on your life as far as how you dress and maybe the way you talk and maybe what you listen to, to as far as Christian music goes, and maybe the version of the Bible you read, you may feel like that there might be a better place for me to worship. I, I don't know. But you see, what was happening with these Gentile Christians is that the Jewish Christians were saying, you've got to do all of these things that we did in order for the atonement of Jesus Christ to be truly effective in your life. And Paul is saying, what in the world are you listening to them for? At one point, he says in the early court, uh, you foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? It's good old King James, isn't it? Who's bewitched you? Because he saw their freedom being taken away. Now, he wanted them to turn loose of that Old Testament 
Jewish law-abiding theology and grab on to the freedom of grace in Jesus Christ. All background. But what was happening now was they were being captivated by something else that was taking away their freedom, and that was the way they were treating each other and behaving to one another. There's no doubt in my mind, and probably no doubt in Paul's mind, that the, the, the Jewish Christians earnestly believed what they believed, and they felt like it was well-founded. And the Gentile Christians, at least initially, felt what they believed, they earnestly believed and held on to. But now the conflict between them had become the main issue it was no longer about the theology. It was about how they treated their brothers and sisters. The church in the world today has presented a terrible pattern of Christian relationships to the world around us. There are a lot of people that know what's happened at First Baptist Church, Chapel Hill, all across this county. I heard about it before I ever came out and talked with you, okay? They know that there was a church divided. There is a church divided. They know that one group left and one group stayed, and they have heard versions of that story from a lot of people, a lot of different people. And what happens is they look at the witness that this church had in this community, and they see it tainted by the fact And something happened in the fellowship here that split it in two. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. And that's free from bad theology, and it's also free from bad attitudes and bad actions. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. And he moves quickly past that. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. This reflects the words of Jesus to the gentleman who asked him the question. Jesus said, Paul says, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour one another, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit. This is a word well chosen, by the way, and we're going to come back to it in a bit. Walk in the, by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh, that is your old sinful nature, your old earthly nature, your old nature that told you you were number one in the world and that what you thought was more important than anybody else, your old nature that caused you to be tempted and to give into that temptation, your old nature that caused you to be hard to get along with, even on mornings besides Monday. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. Paul is just pulling back a little bit the cover from the gospel that he will be preaching across Asia and Europe. And that is a gospel of freedom, but it is a gospel that is empowered by the Spirit of God. The Jewish folks thought their world worked out pretty well because they had a rule for everything. All right. And it, it wasn't just the Ten Commandments. Sometimes we don't explain that well enough. It wasn't just the Ten Commandments. It was the Ten Commandments plus everything that had been added to it over the years. It was a huge amount of law that nobody could possibly obey, but they felt better like that. I, uh, one of the gentlemen who, uh, reflecting on this, said, uh, uh, who of you are going to walk into the youth group, Robert, and say, uh, there are no rules in this world that you have to worry about? Just live by the Spirit. You really want to tell 17 and 18-year-olds that? Most of them are living by the Spirit, at least some Spirit as it is, aren't they? And I'm not just picking on 
on the youth here. It's the same for the rest of us pretty much. It helps to have some rules. It helps to have some guardrails. It ha helps to have us protected from what's on the outside of those guardrails. And for Paul to come in and say, you don't live by the law anymore, you live by the Spirit, is a revolutionary thing. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, another significant phrase, led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. And here Paul divides these into four little groups. Well, they are in four little groups. He doesn't divide them. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery. And I'm not going to spend any time on those because we can all imagine what he has in mind in there. A couple that have to do with uh, religion, idolatry, and witchcraft. And then the longest list of all has to do with interpersonal relationships. Hatred and discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy. Have you ever seen those apparent in Christian lives? You ever seen those apparent in people who profess to follow Jesus? You ever seen churches caught up with those kind of attitudes and actions? And then he mentions the one I like to talk about, drunkenness and orgies. It's been a long time since I've been to an orgy, so I, I can come down pretty hard on those kinds of things. Come down pretty hard on witchcraft. But boy, those in the middle... They get close to me. I warn you, as I did before, Paul writes, that those who live like this, that is by the flesh, who give into the flesh, who do not allow the Spirit to lead them at all, those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. And why will they not? Because they are not led by the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace, forbearance, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, and against such there is no law. Those who belong to Jesus Christ have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. That's theology. That's in the past. If you belong to Jesus, all of that has been crucified on his cross, and since we live by the Spirit, okay, since we live by the Spirit, we come together in our meetings and we come together when we have differences. The assumption is, and I make that assumption, that we have all been crucified with Jesus. We have all accepted his death as being appropriate to our sins before our God and makes it possible for us to come to fellowship with him. But we don't all live by the Spirit. Since we live by the Spirit, Paul says, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Another key phrase, walk by the Spirit, led by the Spirit, in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. Now, you know why Paul said, if you have it in you, get along with each other? Because that pretty much describes who we really are. We are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Our salvation is guaranteed by the blood of Jesus Christ and our relationship to the Father through Him. But our day-to-day -day lives become pitifully short of what Paul says the standard of our living should be. If you've got it in you, live peaceably with each other. And what is it that we have in us? The Spirit. 
the Spirit of God guaranteed to us. Jesus spent some time before, right before he was crucified, talking his, to his disciples about how the Spirit would come and how the Spirit would lead them, how the Spirit would fill them, and how the Spirit would empower them to carry out the mission that he had given them. But the theology we can grab onto because that's stuff we can believe with our mind. That's stuff that we can argue about and fuss about, and that's stuff that we can let divide us as denominations and churches and all. Well, the theology, you know, don't you feel good about your theology? Well, I hope you do. You don't understand how other folks that go to other churches can possibly be so wrong. But, Having a good theology isn't being led by the Spirit. Down through the 2,000 years of Christian history, there are a lot of people who have tried various things to get the Spirit, to be filled with the Spirit, to be baptized with the Spirit. There have been di different manifestations. There were back then. There still are today of when the Spirit has actually had presence in your life. And you know what is the best indicator of the Spirit having it's a presence in your life. It's not your theology. It's not some outward manifestation. It's love and joy and peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. First Baptist Chapel Hill, if you want to be a church that is spirit-led, you will make it a priority, a priority for these things to exist. These are actually things that you practice. These are actually things that you determine to do. Now, you can't do them very well if you're not filled by the, with the Spirit. If you've got the Spirit in you, then you practice them and you get better at them. I don't know how much to make of this, but Paul talks about acts of sin, okay? Actions of sin, and he talks about fruit of the Spirit. Fruit of the Spirit is born by the Spirit that is within us when we give it an opportunity to bloom, when we give it an opportunity to bear fruit. The Spirit produces those things in us as we allow it and encourage it and do our best for it to happen. Will it make you perfect? Absolutely not. But it will make you a good representation of what God's grace can do to any person in all this world. Okay. Did the 12 o'clock whistle blow? I don't know if it did or not. Matthew, can you get to that? Um, how then shall we live? Yeah, there we go. Okay, the, the, these aren't Mike's words. The, these are Paul's words. How then shall we live? First of all, walking in the Spirit. Now, folks, this is it's a good metaphor, walking in the Spirit, because most of us want to run in the Spirit. Those of us over 70 years old may not want to run that much, okay? But most of us do, all right? When, when I came out, most of you expected the work of the transition ministry to be done by the end of January, okay? I mean, you're ready for Mike to hit the ground running, and you were ready for us to get moving. But you got to walk before you can run. That's true in just about everything we can do. If any of you had a child who did not crawl before they walked, you were probably concerned about that because crawling is one of those developmental processes that needs to happen. And in the spiritual life, we all want to soar with the eagles instead of living with the buzzards. But 
You don't soar with eagles on the first day in flight school. You learn to taxi. And then you learn, well, I won't go into all that flying stuff, right? We, we know all about that, but, I, but the fact is you walk. And walking is a good metaphor because it's one foot at a time. My years now, I watch my feet a lot where I put them. Younger years, I've fallen down. I've always been clumsy. I know now if I do that, I'm going to pay a big price. And so, but when we walk, we're careful about where we step, what we step on, what we step in, and all those other things that can happen, okay? Walking in the Spirit is very much like that. It is a deliberate one step at a time process. That's the way the Lord built his church, and it's the way he reveals his church as well. Secondly, read the Bible. It's not just, how in the world do you know what God, what is God's will concerning you? Paul laid that out pretty well, didn't he? So you need to read your scripture. A lot of us want to skip that part. But read it and read it over and over again. Meditate on it. Ask the Spirit to illuminate it for you. You'd be amazed at what you'd be amazed at things you'll see in Scripture that you never saw before. That's why it never gets old. I got old, but the Bible is as fresh today as it ever has been, and I keep discovering new stuff in there. It's not that it's changed. But the way I see it, it's changed. And pray. Those are steps. Praying for the Spirit's leadership. Praying for spiritual discernment as we take those steps. Asking God to help us make the next step in the right direction and at the right time. Okay, go to that next slide, uh, please. And then not just walking, but keeping in step with the Spirit is reading and studying your Bible and praying. It's also practice, and it's also part of being part of the body. One of the first things people all, all, often want to do when there's controversy in the church is, okay, we don't want to be a part of it. We don't want to hear about it. We don't want to talk about it. We don't want to be involved in it. We don't want any of, us, any of it to get on us, or if we do, we want to wash our hands of it. There's no way to walk in the Spirit and keep in step with the Spirit except being part of the body of Jesus Christ. There is no individual walk for the Christian. We step together. We go together. We love together. We cry together. We suffer together. All of those things are part of the body. Again, something Paul so, so lays out so very, very well. So we are led by the Spirit. We need to walk daily, day in and day out. And go to that last slide up there. If you keep making that face or doing that action or thinking those thoughts, you might get stuck that way. <laughs> That's serious. That's serious. A lot of us have known Christians like that. Some of us are Christians like that. Nobody in this room. Me, okay. We've gotten stuck like that in our ways of thinking. We've gotten stuck like that in our ways of behaving. Some of us explain to people why we are like we are. None of us, you know, we've been that way all of our lives. I've been slow all my life. I'm glad Paul didn't say one of the fruits of the Spirit is moving fast because that's something I couldn't do. But all those other things are things we all can do. All those other things are things that we should be expected to do. They are things that can make us 
in the community where we live be the people and the witness to this world so that our theology will have meaning to them. And when we preach our great theological sermons, they'll listen to us because they know that we have been led and are being led by the Spirit. One thing that we want to do over this next year and a half, all of you knew that, right? <laughs> is to seek to be led by the Spirit in all that we do. Whether it's here on Sunday morning or the transition team, or it's the deacons meeting, or in our Wednesday night uh, meals, our Bible studies led by the Spirit. As you encounter this community it led by the Spirit, they'll come to think of you not as the church that was divided, but the church that has been united as being led by the Spirit. We all need to give serious attention to this. We all need to give serious attention to this in the days going forward. Some of you need to make decisions in your life, perhaps, about the direction you're going to go. Some of you need to make commitments today. You don't have to come and tell this preacher about it. But right where you are, you need to make a commitment that I am going to do my best to walk by the Spirit. If you have been saved, if you claim Jesus as your one and only Savior in all this world, then you need to try to live like you've been called to live. And if perchance there's somebody here who the theology part has escaped you entirely, you have never understood why Jesus died for you, and you have never understood why it's necessary to have eternal life, to have a relationship to him, I'd love to talk to you, okay? I'd love to talk to you about that. And maybe working in your heart even today, you have heard something calling you to faith in Jesus Christ. It's a simple, unexplainable thing that exists between you and your Heavenly Father. It's something that can change your life completely. And then you can start on this road with all the rest of us failed Christians who need to be reminded about living by the, in the fruit of the Spirit, living in the, in the Spirit and displaying the fruit of the Spirit. I guarantee you, there's no other life like it in all the world and no other with the payoff of eternal life. Will you pray with me? Our Father, we come today confessing to you that we are still sinful people. Lord, even having claimed the redemption of our lives in the blood of Jesus, Lord, having accepted the fact that our sins have been washed away, day in and day out, we still do things that we don't want to do. There are things that we want to do that we just can't seem to do. And so, Father, we come confessing who we are. Lord, we come desperately asking you to fill us and empower us and give us the, the want to, to walk in the Spirit. Father, if there's anyone here today who can't confess that they are a follower of you, a believer in Jesus Christ. May they make that decision before they leave this place today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's stand together and sing, I need thee every hour. Speak to my heart, Lord Jesus.
Kristen, can we do that without you? I hate to, but let's do that a cappella just sure. the end of it. Okay. Speak to my heart, oh, speak to my heart. Speak to my heart, I pray. Yield it and still. Seeking thy will, oh, speak to my heart today. It's so good to see you here today. If you're visiting with us, give us a chance to visit with you, okay? Before you get away, may the Lord bless and keep you. May the Lord look with favor on you in the week to come. And may he lead you to not only be filled with the Spirit, but to display the fruit of the Spirit in your life each and every day. God bless you. Have a great day. Bye-bye.